This is how I start. I am the prosecutor. I represent the state. I am here to present to you the evidence of a crime. Together you will weigh this evidence. You will deliberate upon it. You will decide if it proves the defendant's guilt. This man, and here I point. You must always point, Rusty. I was told by John Waite. That was the day I started in the office. The sheriff took my fingerprints, the chief judge swore me in, and John White brought me up to watch the first jury trial I had ever seen. Ned Halsey was making the opening statement for the state, and as he gestured across the courtroom, John, in his generous avuncular way, with the humid scent of alcohol in his breath at 10 o'clock in the morning, whispered my initial lesson. He was the chief deputy PA then, a hale Irishman with white hair, wild as corn silk. How come I didn't play him? <laughs> it was almost a dozen years ago, long before I had formed even the most secret ambition to hold John's job myself. If you don't have the courage to point, John White whispered, you can't expect them to have the courage to convict. And so I point. I extend my hand across the courtroom I hold one finger straight. I seek the defendant's eye. I say, this man has been accused. He turns away, or he blinks, or shows nothing at all. In the beginning, I was often preoccupied imagining how it would feel to sit there, held at the focus of scrutiny, ardently denounced before all who care to listen knowing that the most ordinary privileges of a decent life, common trust, personal respect, and even liberty, were now like some clock, cloak, sorry, I can't see too well here, like some cloak that you had checked at the door and might never retreat. I could feel the fear, the hot frustration, the haunted separateness. Now, like ore deposits, the harder stuff of duty and obligation has settled in the veins where those softer feelings moved. Now I have a job to do. It's not that I have grown uncaring, believe me, but this business of accusing, judging, punishing has gone on always. It is one of the great wheels turning beneath everything we do. I play my part. I am a functionary of our only universally recognized system of telling wrong from right, a bureaucrat of good and evil. This must be prohibited, not that. One would expect that after all these years of making charges, trying cases, watching defendants come and go, it might have all become a jumble. Somehow, it has not. I turn back to face the jury. Today you, all of you, have taken on one of the most solemn obligations of citizenship. Your job is to find the facts, the truth. It is not an easy task. I know. Memories may fail, recollections may be shaded, the evidence might point in differing directions. You may be forced to decide about things that no one seems to know or to be willing to say. If you were at home, at work, anywhere in your daily life, you might be ready to throw up your hands. You might not want to make the effort. Here, you must. You must. Let, remind you, let me remind, remind you, there was a real crime. No one will dispute that. There was a real victim, real pain. You do not have to tell us why it happened. People's motives, after all, may be forever locked inside them. But you must at least try to determine what actually occurred. If you cannot, we will not know if this man deserves to be freed or to be punished. We will have no idea who to blame. If we cannot find the truth, what is our hope of justice?
The man to my right wrote those words 20 years ago? More. Scott Turrell. Oh, you want me to go on now? No, I'm, I'm you know, I, I can start if you don't want No, to. I was just, I wanted you to hear how it all began, at least in the larger stage. It began with those first pages of this book, Presumed Innocent, of which one writer, one critic, one person wrote, Presumed Innocent is an achievement of high order with marvelous control and touch, awesome capacity to assemble and dispense and sometimes withhold evidence, and a cast of characters who are dismayingly credible. <laughs> you would never in a million years guess who wrote that. Wallace Stegner, hmm. one of the great writers in American history. Uh, Christopher Lehman Haupt, Haupt, whatever the hell his name is, <laughs> described it. It was so he, the reviews were so extraordinary for it. I remember reading it, and you know that old chestnut you can't put it down, and you could literally not put it down. It's a big goddamn book. <laughs> In fact, he doesn't write small books. He writes lots of big books. Um, what is your, you, you've been a lawyer now for a long time, mm -hmm. in addition to being, to writing about the law. Mm -hmm. What's your definition of crime? What is crime? Uh, well, f first I'll, I'll, an aside, to thank Brian for doing this. Um, I met Brian Dennehy on the set of Presumed Innocent, so it had to be in 1990. Yeah. And uh, I was introduced to him. It was between takes, and we immediately fell into animated conversation. And I still remember some of the things Brian said to me about the process of converting novels into, into movies, including the, the best line, which was that any movie uh, based on a good book can't be anything more than an abridgment because of the, the time limits of film. But we just fell into this rapt conversation, which to some extent has, has not ended since then. But um, we ignored the fact that there was a movie being made. And Alan Pakula, who was getting ready for the next shot, he, he started and apparently he turns around and I'm the visitor to the set, I'm the author to be treated with kid gloves, but he turns around and goes, Brian, please. And so. <laughs> And I felt, like the, I felt like the bad kid in school who got the good kid scolded. <laughs> but thank you for doing this. Well, nobody can scold us now. The, uh, We're not getting paid enough, so. <laughs> well, you are, but I'm not. Yeah, so. my, my definition of crime. Um, I mean, it's got to be hard. Now. It is hard. After I mean, the, the simple definition, of course, is it's what the law prohibits and uh, deems worthy of a sentence in the penitentiary. Uh, the more complicated part, though, is that a judge I used to love, Frank McGarr, in Chicago said, well, look, there's no point in jury instructions. You ought to just throw them in a room and say, do the right thing. Uh, and because crime is really what a community recognizes as being evil, something that is a form of behavior uh, that is so untoward uh, that it uh, justifies a period of imprisonment. Uh, so, or some kind of sanction. Uh, money, yeah, you know. usually. I mean, but in, everybody thinks that somebody who gets probation escaped. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, crime is defined by uh, the loss of liberty, um, and so it's a form of behavior so severe that. It Do you varies. remember a conversation we had? I think it was at the Palm. We've eaten in a lot of good restaurants yes, over the years. This was at the time of OJ's trial. Mm -hmm. And to our amazement, at least, ours, he was exonerated. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a conversation with you uh, that night. And I, I was, like most Americans, I was to some extent at least, excoriating the, 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 tri the attorneys 
or OJ. And Scott had this mysterious grin on his face, which he does a lot uh, in these conversations. And I said, what are you smiling at? He said, well, he said, I remember a lawyer friend of mine saying that getting an innocent man off was only the second greatest thrill of Pretty being an though. attorney. Right, <laughs> right. And I thought about that for a while. I'd love for her to comment about that. Well, that was actually uh, Barbara Babcock, who uh, was a former public defender in Washington uh, and ultimately taught at Stanford Law School. And I heard her say that. Uh, and of course, it, it stuck with me. But yeah. um, the OJ case actually made my career as an op-ed writer because um, I, I actually knew that he was going to be acquitted. So I wrote this op-ed for the New York Times, which was obviously on spec, explaining the acquittal uh, that they were then able to publish the day after he was acquitted. And uh, you know, my, my theory was that uh, there, there was no way you were going to convict O.J. Simpson in front of a minority jury in this, in this city unless you convinced that jury that it was not business as usual. Uh, and that, uh, which involved necessarily taking the LA cops to task uh, for things like lying about the reasons that they went over the wall into Simpson's home. And instead, you know, that hadn't happened and that, you know, he wasn't going to be convicted because it's very, very hard, uh, at least it was in my days as a prosecutor, and it may be a different America now, but, you know, uh, especially African-American juries, did not like to convict successful African-Americans because as one of those jurors once explained to me, she said, you know, who do we have in our own community to look up to? You want us to tear down somebody who's managed to succeed despite all the odds against us? So I, and I just, I knew that he was going to be acquitted. So I was not actually surprised. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, Barry Shack, who handled the DNA, is a, another really dear friend of mine. Uh, and I admired the job they did. And he made a career, actually, out of DNA. He sure so. did. Barry, as far as I'm concerned, deserves the Nobel Peace Prize because he recognized DNA early on um, for its potential uh, to, you know, free uh, the innocent who had been convicted. Now. He also, since he's a really smart guy, recognized that it would make convictions uh, much Solid. easier. Yeah. And uh, he's, you know, frankly, like most people involved in the criminal process, he's happy about that too. There's nothing wrong with putting guilty people in prison. It's funny, I work with Jim McCluskey a lot, you know, centurions. And uh, just talked to him last week, told him about this. He said to say, Yeah, well, Brian has done a lot for the uh, well, Innocence Project lot. over the years. but. Uh, Centurions is uh, a group which, interestingly enough, because Barry shek has got that pretty well covered, is a small group that comes out of uh, uh, Princeton, New Jersey, by this amazing guy, Jim McCluskey. And they do the really, really hard work on people, usually who have been in jail for 20 or 30 years in convictions. And someone has uh, recommended that they took a look, take a look at the case, and they go back and they go through the files, the, tri the arrest records, the trial records, the defense that's been given, and, and the it, appeals. Appeals are very misunderstood in this country. Normally, appeals are purely on procedure, not on the evidence. And evidence can be presented in later times when which it really looks as though at least another trial should happen, but the appeals court will say, that's, that's not our business. Was the trial fair? Was it, was it according to Hoyle? Right. It can be, it's, you know, depending upon the court, depending upon how, how you go, that they'll say this deserves a new trial, but it's rare. Usually it's procedure. Yeah, it's a, an appeal is fundamentally to decide whether there were errors of law Right. made during a trial. Which is interesting. A lot of you people know, don't realize that. The, the facts are to be determined by a jury, and unless no reasonable juror could possibly have come to that conclusion, um, you know, the jury's findings will stand. Which leads me to the, my next question. Yes, sir. <laughs> you are a well-known and admirable opponent of the death penalty. Mm -hmm. 
if the death penalty, either state by state or federally, nationally, is made illegal, doesn't that take a weapon out of the hand of the jury? Out of the hands of the jury? Doesn't it, in other words, doesn't it eliminate one of, one of the choices? Doesn't it take the jury system to task and say, sorry, you can't do this? Well, one of the interesting things about the death penalty is that the sentence is determined by a jury. Because in our system, in the United States, all other sentencing is done by judges. And, uh, but sentencing somebody to death is such an uncomfortable experience that somehow the American judiciary has worked things around to say, well, you know, just the biggest decision the jury. any sentencer is ever going to have to make, that will let the poor people who've walked in off the street, will let them make that, that decision. And, uh, and, and that by itself, you know, ought to tell you something. Yeah, well, uh, it tells me that you don't necessarily think the jury system works. Um, you know, it's, it's routine among trial lawyers to talk about how great juries are. And you know how what a wonderful job they do. And the truth of the matter is that if you actually sit down and talk with jurors after a case, they'll say things like, you know, I knew he was lying. The minute I saw him. <laughs> I, I knew he was lying the minute I saw him. He, he came to the stand, he was wearing a green tie. And I've never met a person told the truth who was wearing a green tie. And it's like, God. So um should, it's just it's just that should we uh, get rid of the jury system? No, I don't think we should get rid of the jury system. Well, why keep it then? Uh, because the truth is they don't do any worse job. You got 12 people together, and together the 12 of them do at least as good a job as any one person, any one judge does in trying to decide cases. Now, are they, you know, there's the saying among trial lawyers, it's always opening night for the jury. So there's some sort of trial lawyers flim-flam that you can pull on a jury that you can never get away with, with the judge who's seen it all before. Uh, but, you know, generally speaking, as a group, uh, somehow they blunder their way to the right decision. Um, but the, the reasoning process by which they do it often uh, will really make you wonder. And all you can take from that is that something is going on in group decision making that's beyond the level of articulation. Well, it may be, it may be uh, what you talked about right at the beginning, which is that there's a reflection of what society, I said maybe, as a group wants the, the criminal system, how it wants it to operate. Right, the, but the, the, you know, the, the jury system exists to protect, it's a political institution, and it's to create an, an, an entity independent of the government uh, to decide whether or not people ought to be subjected to this you know, punishment of the deprivation of liberty. Um, and so that it's not determined by uh, you know, the interested parties in the political system, be they judges or prosecutors. That's all. You know, as I said, that, 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 at that level, that it can work. But, you know, juries are often terribly reflective of, of public prejudice. True. And Through the South in the 50s and 60s. You, it happens. I tried a case, not didn't try a case, but represented an appeal, a guy who um, was, had been convicted and sentenced to death and then conviction thrown out and back to the, back to, for trial, uh, and there was no evidence against this man, none. Uh, but the crime was so horrible, the brutal murder and sodomization of a 10-year-old girl who had been abducted out of her own home. The jury convicted him anyway. And uh, finally, the lawyers who were involved in these cases concluded that the only way to win the cases was to dispense with juries and just take a bench trial. Um, and, and that's when the cases began to unravel. So, you know, juries are, they do reflect the community and they reflect often the worst aspects of the community. Right. So, but do abandon it? No, and I wouldn't abandon it for the reason that it was created to start with because juries are independent. They of the have, uh, not very often, but of course they have, there are examples of juries, as they call them, runaway juries, where they essentially say, 
get rid of that DA. We want another one in here. Uh, which, but I, I'm assuming that that's uh, so rare as to be virtually non-existent. But uh, you find it occasionally with grand juries. And uh, but what about the grand jury? Why why is why is there such a thing as the grand jury? If they are so grand, why don't they why aren't they always the juries? Well, um, the grand jury again was created. Um, basically on the same logic, that before somebody is indicted and put to trial for a crime, there should be independent verification by a group of citizens of the prosecutor's case. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not bad in theory. Of course, the saying is that, you know, a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich if a prosecutor asked them to do so. And uh, the only time I really found the grand jury independent was when I was doing police brutality cases. And uh, you struggled with the grand jury to get them indict, to indict cops. cops yeah. um, they just, they hated to indict cops uh, for doing their job, even if they had done it badly. So, but, you know, and you, but again, you sit there and look at the grand jury, and six of them are sleeping, uh, some of them are reading, uh, some of them are knitting, and it's like, wow. Uh, but there are always two or three who were paying very close attention. And, uh, and they would put you to your proof. They would ask the really good questions. Who gets, why a grand jury? Who does the grand jury? I mean, is that, that's obviously solicited and chosen by prosecutors, right? Not, not defense lawyers. Well, no, there's no participation at all by defense lawyers in grand juries in most states and certainly not federally. Uh, Massachusetts, the defense lawyers actually have the right to sit there, keep their mouth shut, and see what's going on. Uh, grand jury, you know, you get a jury summons the same way as a pettit jury, uh, and uh, the chief judge of the district or uh, circuit will impanel the grand jury. But they never hear from anybody but the prosecutor. And of course, over a period of time, uh, they develop a, basically a personal relationship with the prosecutor mm. and assume, usually correctly, that the prosecutor was not going to lie to them or try to deceive them. And so they generally do whatever the prosecutors ask. Is that a, is that a what is the, what, in your experience, which is considerable, you're still practicing law, right? Yes. Um, what is the batting average as far as a DA or an assistant DA deciding, okay, I'm going to go before the grand jury? Is this a 30% number, 40% number, 10% number? Because even that decision I was a, is an important decision. I was an assistant U.S. attorney, federal prosecutor, for eight years. And in my eight years, there were probably about 8,000 cases indicted, and there were two no bills returned. That is a, a case in which the grand jury voted by majority not. No, I understand. Done. But what I'm asking is, what would you say the percentage is or of, of the DA deciding himself or his staff, let's pursue this, let's go to the grand jury or let's not? Is it overwhelmingly, like say 70% of the time that once they've performed an investigation, they'll go to the grand jury or do they... Is it half the amount of times that they'll actually go to a grand jury? When I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, most of the cases that came into the office were not prosecuted, more than 50%. Yeah. So, and that was for various reasons. There wasn't a crime, it wasn't adequately investigated, it just wasn't provable. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't mean there wasn't a must, crime. Must piss off a lot of cops, I would think. Well, the, the, that's really one of the biggest differences between the state and the federal system. Federal system, generally speaking, is run by the assistant U.S. attorneys. Right. Uh, they have their own investigation. And they, they got their own views and access to grind. And, of course, uh, you're basically the client as an AUSA, and you don't want to go up to court and lose. And what's federal? Also, it's federal. But, they're being charged with federal. Right. But you, get, you, you, know, you pick your cases. In, the state, in most state systems, the charging... Uh, the, the charging body is really the police. Well, you had that you had that guy in Chicago. What the hell was his name? That was the bane. He was obviously at the, what the hell was it? Harrington think, Harrison. Remember? Were you thinking about the uh, the prosecutor Hanrahan or Ed Hanrahan? No, or were you it thinking was, about uh, John Burge. 
a really good looking guy who was cricking around 15, 20 years ago, and everybody thought he was going to make a run for the governorship, but I guess he didn't wind up doing it. Remember, there was a lot of complaints about him in Chicago. And Chicago, uh, there's usually not a lot of complaints about law and order because most of the people are guilty. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh, hell, Carrington, wasn't his name Harrington? He was a federal. Federal prosecutor? Prosecutor, something like that. He had a name, I don't know, I can't remember. I can't remember the lines I got to do tomorrow. So <laughs> what the hell am I going to make? But anyway, it's, a, it's fascinating, the whole process of, of the law, how it happens, how it is prosecuted, how it is, how it is uh, used by the people who, are, who have to use it. Because there was such an, a, an element of choice right from the beginning of the whole process. You know, what can we do? What can we get this guy? Can we not get this guy? Should we try to get this guy? Should it be prosecuted? Well, at well all? you know, generally speaking, the question you started with, though, is that uh, in order to get prosecuted, the behavior involved has got to be such that right, that's just I mean. about everybody looking at it goes, nah, this, we can't let this go. Right, yeah. Uh, and uh, if you just don't have a gut feeling that this is really wrong, then it's not going to make its way through the system as a case. And uh, I would say that probably the media has something to do with it, too, right? It, 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 you know, the, the media has a large effect, uh, more so when prosecutors and judges are elected, which is true in, in, in most of the states in the right. country. You know, federal judges, they're, they're there for life. The U.S. attorneys are usually serve a term. Uh, so they're less, not completely, but l more isolated from politics. I would say from, in terms of our relationship, which has been delightful and very interesting, despite some of my drunken behavior in the past. <laughs> we don't um, have to tell those stories. And uh, that you, interestingly enough, for somebody like yourself who not only practices the law, but who writes about it as well as anybody has ever written about it. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff here that probably don't have time to, uh, to read to you. Wonderful little excerpts that I love of his stuff. But um, so my question is, without leaning into it and, and giving you a leading question is, how cynical about law are you, if you are cynical at all? How do you feel about it after the, all these years of writing about it and observing it from one of the most wonderful seats in the world, which is right there in the middle of Chicago, which is a fantastic place, which I love very much. And uh, it represents better than any other probably urban area in the United States what is good and what is rough about this country. So you've been there, and you've seen it. You've tasted it. You've been a part of it. How do you feel about the law? Well, you know, I think to some extent the law is held to different um, expectations. You go to a museum you, or a gallery. You look at the paintings on the wall. You go, well, you know, I, I don't really like this work. It doesn't do very much for me. No, nobody gives up on the idea of art. Uh, because, uh, because a particular, in a particular case, it's been poorly achieved. Um, but, you know, the law is always supposed to be right, always supposed to be fair, uh, always supposed to be um, fully considered and judicious in the results that it comes to. And the very idealism of the law undermines it uh, because there are no human institutions that always function uh, at that level. And so there's always this distance between the reality of the human beings uh, who play their part in that system uh, and hope to achieve this ideal and the ideal itself. And in that space is where my novels traditionally right. have resided. Uh, it's not that I don't believe in the law. I think it's really a noble enterprise and it's a engaged in trying to make uh, the little bit of life that human beings can actually control, it's make that little bit more fair. Reasonably fair. And that's a good, that's a good thing to be trying to do. Uh, and very often it succeeds, and sometimes it doesn't. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we should be upset when it doesn't succeed. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the institution is inherently corrupt. No, I wasn't suggesting that. I, what I mean by cynicism is, I mean, you can't be in my business for 30 years or 35 years and have a reasonable amount of success and a tremendous amount of rejection without being incredibly cynical about the business. And it's pretty hard not to be, and I'm not. I am cynical as hell. Um, but you still believe in art. Yeah, when you get a chance to perform it or <laughs> destroy it or whatever. Um, and sometimes the two merge, and sometimes they don't. But I've been pretty lucky because I've been able to do, usually in the theater, I've been able to commit art uh, and uh, hope that I get away with it. And I'm not cynical about that. I'm not cynical about this project that I'm doing here, but it is daunting, to say the least. But the, but the truth of the matter um, is that... But in your case, it, it's a different kind but of But even thing. when you're watching... A, 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 even when you're watching the filming of a not particularly great television show, there are artful moments by the actors or the directors or the editors or, I mean, there are moments. The writers. And there, and there are moments that are, you know, really transcendent and transformational, even though, you know, maybe it's a lousy script, but the actor does amazing things with it. So, um, it's, I, I, you know, it's, it's a weird thing, but maybe as I'm getting older, I'm less cynical. Yes, I think your, that's true. To answer your question. I think you're a lot less cynical than you were, say, 20 years ago. Right. Which is interesting. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm I don't know whether, whether or not I am or not. I don't know. But um, let, me, uh, let me do one, maybe one more of these here before we let you off the hook. <laughs> um, I've got to find the right one now. Yeah, this is what I like. This is a book I wrote. And I'm about three quarters of the way through, and people always say, do you ever write these books thinking of a particular actor? And, I'm, and I don't. I really don't. But I'm, the only time it ever happened is I'm three quarters of the way through this book, and I'm thinking, oh my god, this would be perfect for Brian. This would be absolutely perfect for Brian. And of course, it, it never came to pass 20 years after the book was written. There, finally was a decent script for a TV series written. And Brian played a part, but he didn't play the lead. No, no. Who, played, who did play the lead? A uh, really gifted actor whom you loved in the part, Jason Isaacs. Yeah, terrific. Turo, you know, one Son of those of many pitch. people waiting to be a star who should be. Turo's novels are not mere entertainments. They transcend their genre. They are literature that will last. The cadences of Turo's prose, as well as the substance of his stories, are as urban as the sound of a jazz saxophone at 2 o'clock in the morning. Turo's Kindle County is acquiring as much reality as a convincing moral landscape comparable to William Faulkner's Yoknabatafa York, County. Pronounce that three times fast. <laughs> George Will. Yeah. Pretty smart guy. <clears throat> 20 years ago, before they shipped me off to financial crimes to give me time to finish law school. I worked in the tactical unit with a good street cop named Gino DeMonte, who everybody called pig eyes. Tack guys are plain clothes, the sort of roving linebackers of the force who do further investigation on what the beat cop reports, stake out an arrest, round up a suspect. I learned a lot from pig eyes which is one of the things that ticked him off when I testified about him before a federal grand jury. These days, he's backwatered in financial crimes, and as the legend goes, always looking for me. The same way that Captain Hook had an eye out for the crocodile and Ahab for the whale. Anyway, Pig Eyes taught me a million tricks. How to sneak the cruiser down an alley, headlights out, using the emergency brake to stop so that your suspect doesn't even see the red glow of the rear, rear lamps. I watched him get into an apartment without a warrant by making calls, saying he was UPS, and left a package downstairs, or that he lived across the street and thought there was a fire on the roof so that our man would come rushing out and leave his door wide open. 
I even heard him phone and say there were suspicious guys around and have a high old time when the dip stuck his mug out with an unregistered, unregistered pistol in his hand and got his ass arrested and his front room tossed, incident to arrest. This was another of Gino's little bits, just a makeup mirror that a lady would carry in her purse or keep in the drawer in her office as brushy had. In most old buildings, the front door in an apartment had been trimmed at the floor to fit the carpeting. And with the mirror, if you get used to looking upside down, you can see a lot. I knelt there in the vestibule, putting my ear to the door to the upstairs apartment now and then to make sure that the neighbor wasn't shaking around. As I remember, she was a flight attendant. I figured on trying her sometime after I'd seen what was in Bert's apartment. Sure looked like he was gone. In the mirror, I could see the mail piled up on the floor in heaps, Sports Illustrated, health and muscle magazines and flyers, of course, a bunch of bills. I rumbled around a little bit against the door, enough noise so that if there was anyone inside, I'd get them moving. Then after a while, I used the coat hangers, straightened them out, all but the hook, and joined them at the crimps. Using the mirror, I could see the chain lock hanging open. I must have spent five minutes trying to get a decent purchase on the knob of the deadbolt. And then it turned out the damn thing wasn't even set. The old skeleton key lock, door lock, and knob came off with the screwdriver in 20 seconds. I always told Nora, if they want to get in, they're coming in. That's pretty goddamn good writing. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, George V. Higgins. Yeah. What do you think of George? I mean... <laughs> I, I would say, I, I'll never forget when I, I'm probably going to get hammered for this, when I saw Affleck's really good pictures, two movies, and I immediately thought of George V. Higgins and the Friends of Eddie Coyle, right. which was the first. I thought they were remaking the Friends of Eddie Coyle. No? Well, they did remake it, but they didn't credit him. Oh, and I, I don't think right. his estate got any money. Uh, George V. Higgins was a Boston writer, if any of you are so inclined. It's a different kind of writing than... Uh, he was the greatest writer, though. I, I mean, along with Elmore Leonard, he yeah. had... Well, Leonard gave Higgins credit. He had just a remarkable way with dialogue yeah. and uh, of telling his stories almost completely with dialogue. And Higgins knew um, I intimately the language of the people whom he prosecuted, first as an assistant U.S. attorney and then defended years later. And uh, of course, I was always deeply indebted to George because he wrote one of the first reviews of Presumed Innocent. Oh, and, I missed that one. God and, damn it, I thought uh, I had them all. You know, it was wildly laudatory. Uh, but he sent me a message that uh, they won't let you continue to practice. So don't try. Lawyer me. Because yeah, he did. He himself was a lawyer. Yeah. But they won't let you. And I was, I was never figured out who they were. Yeah, well, they were probably the bartenders at Lockovers, <laughs> because that's where you used to see him in Boston all the time. He was a real Irishman. He was a great writer. And he was a great writer, but not as good as you. Well. Because your books are much more complete, much richer. George would do something, which is a very interesting thing to do. He would pick out three people, maybe four, lowlifes, inevitably, and he would record in his mind, every bit of conversation. But there was no greater picture. I mean, the society was captured with those four guys. And uh, he drank himself to death and smoked himself to death at an early age, which was a great loss. But what Scott does is so different and so powerful and so all-encompassing and so beautif beautifully written. The literature is just amazing for me. This is one of my, what is the opening situation? I just love this. This is a great opening. Worthy of and perhaps better than Higgins or Leonard. He knew it was wrong and that he was going to get caught. First sentence. He said he knew this day was coming. He knew they had been stupid, he told me. Worse Greedy. He said he knew he should have stopped, but somehow each time he thought they'd quit, he'd ask himself, 
how once more could make it any worse. Well, now he knew he was in trouble. I recognized the tune. Over 20-some years, the folks sitting in that leather club chair in front of my desk have found only a few old standards in the jukebox. I didn't do it. The other one did it. <laughs> Why are they picking on me? His selection, I'm sorry, made the easiest listening. But they all wanted to hear the same song from me. Maybe I can get you out of this. I said it usually, although I knew it would often prove to be untrue, but it's a complicated business being somebody's only hope. How the hell do you, how do, you do that? Because I want to be able to do it. That's just true. That's just what it is to be a defense lawyer. Yeah, but boy, and I'll tell you, what a, what a way to start a book. I, you know, I like that book a lot. So that's from personal injuries. And, uh, but that was a book, you know, that I wrote. Um, and I was focused on the federal uh, investigation into judicial corruption that I'd been a part of as a prosecutor. And, uh, you know, that's where I started. And I really didn't... Um, know whether I should like the book or not when I finished it. I thought I'd done a good job, but it had turned into something so different than what I thought I was writing about to start. Uh, and the, the hero, Robbie Favor, um, who was this government informant. Amazingly flawed. Yeah, deeply, deeply flawed and, Wonderful uh, character. and somehow um, deeply human. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I like that book a lot. Yeah, me too. Well, I, I hate to repeat myself, so I'm always trying to do something different. And I yeah, repeat this, myself all the time. This, well, yes, night after night, <laughs> one would hope. The, the playwright would be very disappointed. Well, playwrights disappointed don't think if, I repeated enough. But, uh, <laughs> well, wait a minute, there was that thing, you know, you had that thing. Right? That's why it's always good to work with dead playwrights. <laughs> and dead directors, if you can work it, but usually... <laughs> Usually they're around, unfortunately. <laughs> so, are we supposed to take questions, Ted? Yeah, we think we better, huh? Yeah, I'll bring the microphone to you. Just a I reminder, questions, tomorrow. questions start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. There is no such thing as a two-part question, and only Brian Denny gets to ask follow-up questions. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask, may I ask two questions? <laughs> One, one, just one. Oh, oh. let her ask two. Oh, Look thank at how gorgeous you. she is. What's wrong with you? Go sit down. Thanks, house. thanks. Uh, the first one is, is about a, a lawyer's dilemma, a moral dilemma. Like, uh, you, in case you have a defense, you are a defense lawyer, and you and the and you the guy told you that he did it. Yeah. And still you have to prove it. I know, I understand that you have everybody has the right to be defended and mm -hmm. stuff. But it's a horrible crime, and you know he did it. Mm -hmm. How is your internal reaction? How would you do? Well, you ha don't you, as an officer of the court, you can't do that, right? No, you, what you can't do, that, and this is different uh, between the UK, where if your client tells you he's guilty, uh, you can't take him to trial, uh, which, of course, guess what happens in the UK? You tell the client when he walks. If you tell me you're guilty, you can't have a trial. So, First thing you do, yeah. Um, so nobody says to the lawyer, I'm guilty. Um, in this country, if the client says to you, I am guilty, uh, you can't, assuming that he doesn't just give you a legal conclusion, but actually describes the crime, uh, then you cannot put uh, him or her uh, on the witness stand to testify to the contrary. They can't say that, uh, they can't get up there and lie. Um, and the, the rules of ethics are pretty clear about that. Um, although they were pretty hotly debated till the Supreme Court decided a case on that issue. Um, but in, in this country, uh, the mantra is that everybody is entitled to a defense. And furthermore, that what the criminal system is about is uh, protecting people from an overreaching government. Uh, and that's why the government has to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt before they can put you 
in prison. So the question isn't, isn't whether the defendant did it. The question is whether the government can prove it. Uh, and most criminal defense lawyers, including me, believe it. Now, most of the time when the client tells you uh, that he, or very rarely she, is guilty, they are on the road uh, to accepting responsibility and more, most of the time end up wanting to plead guilty. Uh, so the lawyer doesn't find him or herself in that dilemma. Sometimes the client says, I did it, and the consequences of being convicted uh, are you know, so severe that they're going to go to trial anyway. And personally, I don't have any problem with that system. It, uh, it has never bothered me. You know, I've got a follow-up. Okay. Supposing that happens. Okay. Supposing somebody says, yeah, I did it, uh, but I want to go to trial, and they go to trial, uh, or they plead out or whatever, or whatever the situation is, the, the trial is not very successful, or they plead out, and then they say they've got a lousy defense. Yeah, that happens. That happens. Believe me, um, when you get into uh, the world of criminal law, and start representing criminals. Uh, generally speaking, if, if you expect them to behave uh, like wire boys, <laughs> to be faithful or loyal or grateful. Tell the truth. You know, it's not going to happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be accused of, uh, you know, <laughs> my, my beloved friend George Katsourilis, who is now gone, used to, used to say that, Remember about your client. Not only is he own, his own greatest enemy, he is also yours. Your enemy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's why they get the money up front, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. When the money comes from the bank, I'll take your phone call. Yeah. Okay? Second one is about your process of writing. When you, you start, a, you have the, the subject, you go, to, you character dri driven or, and how you organize yourself because your books are kind of intricate. Uh, you do a, a outline and you go, how do you work? Uh, I, don't, I don't outline at all. Uh, and the way individual novelists write, I think is, is remarkably varied. Uh, but I, I start with an idea um, and uh, I start exploring it. And sometimes that may mean research. Uh, and I'll start doing the research, but um, the research will spur me to um, not to just write down facts, but to write scenes or to write descriptive sentences based on what I've learned. I start to imagine characters, and usually I will write over a process of many months uh, a, a history of the character. And um, you know, I want to know everybody's background before uh, I put the novel in motion. I start to envision scenes. I start to see the conflicts that are coming and the lines of dialogue that will embody that conflict. I'll describe physical settings. Uh, and I don't care what order I'm doing that in. I get up every morning, and if something uh, is gripping to me, if I have a clear sense of what I want to write about, then I just write it down. And I do that for about a year. And then after a year, uh, I have to start putting that in order. And uh, one reason the plots get so convoluted is because I've got something over here that I like and something over there that I like. And how in the world am I going to get them in the same story? Uh, and uh, then, then it's all sequentially arranged. Uh, were it not for the invention of the personal computer, I would not be sitting here. I could never, could never have done that. Uh, but I do. And then the book goes through three or four drafts. Uh, like a lot of people, I hate rewriting. Uh, and I hate having to cut my own stuff. But I do it uh, rigorously. Um, and you know, then I start again. Do you have an editor that you Yeah, trust? I have had. Uh, I've been, in terms of the novels that I've written, I've had two editors. Uh, both of them are terrific. The editor I work with now, Deb Futter at Grand Central, uh, is very canny. 
uh, very good. But I think what really distinguishes a great editor, and I've had two now, um, is that the question they are always asking is, how do I help this writer write the book that he or she wants to write? Not, you know, not how do I help the author write the book that I wish you know, she or like he would read. have written, yeah. or even what I, what, that I would like to read. But how do I help that author write the book that I clearly can see she or he wants to write? Well, it makes sense then you would have the same people that you would be depending upon, right? Because they you, think like you do. If it, yeah, if it works, you would think it, you would. So. Mm. And There's you some, figure a year for, I mean, you've written. Three years, three years between books. One year of wandering around in the desert, uh, and then a year of getting a really good first draft together, uh, and then a year of submitting myself to the judgment of other people. Famously, some writers have, I've known a couple, a couple that were famous, uh, get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go and write. Whether they have ideas or... Anything to say, whatever it is, six days a week, seven days a week, like right. going to a job. That's what Stegner taught me. Really? That's what St I was a student of Wallace. That, that you know, you read blurbs; they're all wonderful. And the, you know, well, Wallace well, Stegner's pretty goddamn impressive. Well, impressive Wally, Wally was a wonderful person and a great teacher. But the stuff that he taught me that really stays with me is very practical. And Wally said, "You don't write a novel by uh, hoping that the muse strikes and you." write the whole thing out in four hours. You put your rear end in a chair every day. Uh, Wally liked to write two pages every day, no more, no less. I can't work like that, but I do force myself to write because that, that's the only way you're going to get it done. Right. So. Well, you're in the right place in Chicago. It's got it's just lots of stuff happening in Chicago. What was the book about race? That was a wonderful book. That about day. race? You mean studs? No, Seth. What's his name? Uh, the polit politi politics. Oh shit! I got it in here someplace. Why don't you ask your question? Yeah, the Sir question Rob. was: Would the jury system be any better if there were such a thing as professional jurists? Oh God. Well, we have professional jurists. They're sitting up in the bench, um, and uh, occasionally they're called on to decide cases. Years ago, when the, I was involved in these judicial corruption cases, a um, guy came in and took a bench trial in one of these cases. And his lawyer was very canny. And he knew that the judge before whom he was trying the case uh, he knew that his Achilles heel was that he liked to believe he was the smartest guy in the world. And uh, he put on the case, and he's arguing there was not federal jurisdiction in the case. And he made a final argument along the lines of, no other judge in this building would be willing to decide this. But you alone, judge, have the courage and the independence <laughs> to do it. And of course, the judge, like a you know, fish looking at a worm, went, went right for it. And it was totally untoward. It was a ridiculous um, decision. And I realized at that moment that corruption is horrible. And it's a bad thing when you know, judges take money in order to influence uh, their verdicts or their judgments or their decisions. But it's not, it's not the only forms of human vulnerability. And of course, the judiciary being that it's a human institution, embodies all of them. And uh, as I said, the one thing a jury has going for it that is that it's 12 people. Uh, would they be better able to handle uh, antitrust cases if they were professional jurors? Of course. Uh, would, would, it, would it no longer be opening night for the jury every time? Yes. Uh, but, you know, they would uh, achieve an institutional identity that would not make them separate from the government, and that's the main idea of the jury. So I, I, I wouldn't vote for it personally, for professional jurors. Somebody had their hand up in the back before. Somebody, yes, sir. I've been a defense lawyer for about 35 years and really don't disagree with anything you've said. The question I have is the mindset of writing as a lawyer and writing as a novelist and how you make the shift. Because 
obviously legal writing, you right. you have a different function. Right. So how do you do that? How difficult do you find it? Um, you know, I mean, this is many years later. I don't. I didn't think at the time, though. I found it um, all that different. Uh, I had a friend who uh, was a graduate student at Stanford when I was there as a writing fellow, a guy named Mark Sabin, who uh, then went off to teach in the University of Minnesota English department, uh, and eventually left there and became a lawyer, now a very successful one in Minneapolis. But Mark said to me that you know the lawyer's voice, he thought of it as a matter of voices, and the lawyer's voice is just another voice in the panoply of uh, you know the human choir, and uh, you know the lawyer's voice is generally very restricted. Uh, it doesn't use a lot of metaphor. Uh, doesn't talk about things like love. Doesn't appeal to emotion. Uh, but it's just another voice. And if you think of it that way, um, you know I I don't think legal writing uh, is is that distinct from other. Uh, endeavors, as long as you realize that it's, um, it, it you know it, it's the, the the lawyer the lawyer's voice may be thought of as you know the 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 guy in gray flannel or somebody with a stick up his ass, but um, it it is restricted. Uh, it's certainly not like the prose that any novelist uh, wants to write. Um, but you know it, it it's it, there are some people who are not interesting speakers or who are interesting within a very narrow range. And that, to me, is legal writing. Thank you, Brian, for a really interesting leading, a really interesting conversation. But you've left out one thing that I've wanted to ask Scott, and that is about writing about sex. Because you do that so well. And I don't even really know what my question is. Sorry, Ted, except that how, how well, it's one thing to write number? well about. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, it's one thing to write well about the law and legal proceedings, et cetera, but it's another thing to write so well about sex. Do you and the find question it? is? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I wanted to Do introduce Do I have a subject. vivid imagination? Is that the question? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the question. Um, wow. <laughs> what a... Speaking of lawyers, <laughs> be careful here. Um, well, I, I do think um, I do think that, and, and you can, you know, recognize this when you look at you know what goes on on the internet. I think people spend a lot of time uh, thinking about this this kind of this activity, uh, and it is. Uh, you know, it, it is both, um, you know, stressful, uh, sometimes disappointing, and often a great deal of fun. Uh, but, you know, there, people spend a lot of time thinking about sex because it's very uh, meaningful to them. And my own approach to writing about it is to uh, assume that even, um, even when it's supposedly meaningless, that it is actually very meaningful. And, um, and that it, you know, it stands apart from the rest of life. Um, and it really is a kind of magic moment between usually two people. Uh, and, that, um, and so I guess I treat it fundamentally uh, with awe and respect. Scott, Did anybody beat that question? <laughs> question about adaptation of your books into movies. Do you get involved in the process in any way? Do you, or are you, like Dave Barry said, sell the house but don't drive by and wonder what they did with the drapes? <laughs> um, well, there are a lot of great um, sayings, you know, like, like Dave's. One, Hemingway recommended that all novelists bring their, uh, bring their book to the California-Nevada border, that they... Uh, throw the book over, grab the check, and run like hell back east. And um, I think the first conversation I had with Brian, he said, 
he says, we were, we were talking about it. And he says, look, if, I, if, if we filmed everything in your book, it would take about 14 hours. Mm -hmm. And we'll be lucky, he said, if the studio gives us two hours with this movie. So you have to understand that every movie uh, is uh, no better than a good abridgment of a novel. So what that means is that if you're going to write a screenplay based on your own novel, you're basically performing surgery on yourself. And I've never, I've never been able uh, to do that. Uh, as the years have gone on, and I've seen this process happen a number of times, I'm better at kibitzing. Uh, and I have read drafts of screenplays and raised questions. Uh, but I think it's really important that, that somebody else make those critical decisions about what to leave out. Because if I thought any of it was expendable, I wouldn't have put it in the novel in the first place. So I've got to remit that to an, you know, another intelligence. One of the uh, most recent and unremarked but very remarkable events was the release of a movie, and believe me, I cannot think of it. Somebody probably here knows. The screenplay of which was written by Cormac McCarthy. Hmm. Just the screenplay. Hmm. And talk about coming and going. That movie was in and out real fast, and the reviews were not kind. This is one of the great writers Absolutely. ever of, in any Absolutely. country. Well, that doesn't mean that, you know, well, he wrote the screenplay, and he got credit. And unfortunately, it pops up when <laughs> I remember I was but that doesn't mean idly that... watching one of the sports events of the last couple of weeks. And all of a sudden, well, no, I don't know what it means. But it's funny, because it, the movie came and went real fast. And I said, I, I, I've got that wrong. It wasn't Cormac McCarthy. And it was. To have and to have not. Uh, novel by Ernest Hemingway, screenplay by William Faulkner. <laughs> not very good movie. <laughs> Well, Faulkner, of course, the famous Faulkner about story was he was in LA for the money, you know, and writing screenplays. And they used to make him go to the set, you know, and they had those little writers' houses at MGM. And uh, he famously asked somebody who ran the studio. In those days, studios were run by real moguls. Do I have to come in every day? Can't I just write at home? And the guy said yes. The next thing he was, he was in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Well, you said I could go home." But anyway, uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's interesting. Who the hell? Who would be an exception to the rule that usually screenwriters are not novelists and vice versa? There are very few exceptions. Very few. My friend Rick Russo has managed yeah, to write he's, good, he's, good, he's great a, novels and, and great he screenplays. He writes screenplays for that. Right? He writes and he's written a number of screenplays very successfully. And it's, um, I don't understand how he does it. The one thing Rick says is that every time he writes a screenplay, his next novel gets, you know, bigger and bigger because he wants to put, well, in, he's also ev put in everything about, he left out in the screenplay. He's writing about where I live, which is the, the northeast. Rust Belt Northeast, <laughs> and which is... Uh, when you get outside of Weston and Westport and Greenwich is uh, not very picturesque, and uh, he gets it right. Oh, he knows. He knows where he, he speaks. He knows that he gets it right. Um, but uh, it is rare for somebody to be able to do both. I Street. just had a question when you were mentioning about your writing day and that you write first thing in the morning. How do you balance your writing with your practice of law? Because it seems like you're going to have to segment out your day um, because they, it's not something that would be able to, you can't be taking a call while you're writing and so forth. And how do you do that? Well, I haven't practiced law full time for since 1990. And um, in the old days, I would write in the morning and then come into the law office in the afternoon. Get on the train. Take the train. And I'd take the train. Uh, whether, no matter whether I'm going in in the morning or going in in the afternoon. Obviously, things like court calls, you've got to go in in the morning. Um, and I, I would do that. Um, as things became more and more electronic, I was able to spend more time at home. The one gift I had was having the right clients uh, who accepted the fact that I had another career. Most of them realized that either... Um, you know, every lawyer's got something else to do, whether it's other clients or having another career. 
and, uh, and I could be very trusting with them. And if they, if they needed to talk to me, they would call me at home. Uh, and they have done that over the years. The, the, the one thing I have going that's unusual for many writers is that I can be in the middle of a sentence when a client calls, talk to him for 20 minutes, put down the phone, and go back to the sentence. Uh, and uh, I don't exactly know what explains that, but I can, it, it's, you know, occasionally some, some, something is really vexing and you've got to drop everything and deal with it. Uh, but if it's routine stuff, I can integrate the two somehow or, or not integrate them. What do you mean by routine? Do you do murder stuff? Well, no, Serious? I haven't. Uh, I've done a few murder cases, but, um, you know, very few. Um, and I just mean the client calls up and says, you know, the, uh, when do we have to get these discovery responses out? I can't get the people in the... No, but I mean, it's a criminal law. Most of what I've done in private practice criminal has law. been criminal law. So... Which I... Speaking as an outsider, I mean, God knows I've played a hell of a lot of cops and lawyers, and knowing I have no idea what I'm doing. But it would seem, or it seems to me, that it would have built into it a level of concern and anxiety that would make it difficult to move back and forth between the two things. Well, uh, obviously the stakes in criminal cases are very high. Um, most of what you do, though, is sort of embodied in that first paragraph of personal injuries, where um, usually when you're dealing with your client, um, you're half, in a criminal case, you're, you're half psychiatrist. Right. Um, and uh, You're making judgments right from the beginning. Well, you're trying to... Which a psychiatrist is not supposed to do, but I'm sure they do. Right, but you're, you're trying to... I mean, there, there are two different classes of clients. Most, most of the people I have represented, I've represented in the grand jury phase. They haven't gotten indicted, and in most cases that is because they didn't commit any crimes. Those people understandably feel uh, that they are being oppressed by right. their government. Uh, and of course, in many instances, they're right. Mm. Uh, especially if they didn't commit a crime and they're being investigated. And I've seen the government um, you know, just as I did when I was a prosecutor, basically <coughs> ruin people's lives for years. Um, so you have clients who are anxious and upset about the latest subpoena, uh, and you talk them through it and basically tell them it's a process uh, and it's horrible, uh, but it is going to end someday, uh, and the right thing is going to happen, and most of the time that's what occurs. And then you go back to writing the next sentence. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you're doing right now with the Authors Guild. And is there such a thing as copyright anymore? Oh, God, what a wonderful question. Uh, for the last three and a half years, I have been the president of the Authors Guild, which is not the Writers Guild. Um, the Writers Guild operates representing screenwriters. The Authors Guild represents, you know, professional book authors. Uh, and, uh, and, and these days, a, a broader group uh, of, you know, People are trying to make their living writing books. Um, but um, what's going on with the advent of ebooks is a sort of free for all in which all of the participants in the digital ecology are trying to enhance their position uh, almost always at the expense of authors. Uh, so, uh, and, I'm, and, and none of this is meant to condemn ebooks. I like ebooks. I, um, I, I do most of my reading that way because I travel so much. Um, but um, just as a brief sampling of what's going on now, um, you have uh, a lot of book piracy taking place, offshore sites, because it costs almost nothing uh, to pirate a book. Uh, so sites like Pirate Bay uh, will you know, sell you the latest novel. They won't sell it to you. They'll give it to you for free because they're advertising supported. The search engines, places like Google and Bing and Yahoo, uh, will lead you to those pirate sites. If you put free Scott Turo ebook in any one of the search engines, six pirate sites will turn up out of the first 10 
results. And they're able to do that with, uh, with legal immunity, which I think is a terrible thing. Um, if, it, if that weren't enough, Google has gone and copied uh, the contents of seven major university libraries, and they want to make that um, available for search. Uh, and they want to be able to get money, of course, every time anybody clicks. Uh, but they don't want to share any of that money with the people who created that material and supposedly have a copyright on it. Uh, and. Uh, they claim, well, we're just displaying snippets. But the truth, of course, is they're using the entire book for commercial purposes. Uh, you have academics who live by the motto that information wants to be free uh, and uh, believe that copyright is an obstruction uh, to their uh, ability to you know, engage in their scholarship. Certainly, they don't care about the loss of profits from their own books because those books don't make any profits. Uh, and more, moreover, uh, they, uh, their livelihood does not come from book writing. Their livelihood comes from the universities that support them. Uh, you know, there are scuffles with libraries that uh, you know, want to be able to make uh, e-books available from home. That is now happening with the consent of the publishers. But all of this, none of this is bad for me, frankly. Uh, it's a great world in which to be a best-selling author. And uh, if you want to talk about the rock bottom remainders and all the members of the rock bottom remainders, things are swell for all of us, for, for, for Dave Barry and Amy Tan and Mitch Album and Steve King and, and Greg Isles and me. It's fine. It's a great world. But what's happening is the, um, as publishers try to lower royalties on e-books, for example, is there are fewer and fewer people who can support themselves as authors. Uh, and the result is that either they're forced into the world of self-publication, which I'm glad it's out there, um, but uh, it forces every author to be his own editor and marketing guru. Uh, and very few authors succeed in that world. Uh, and the ultimate effect of this is that it will you know, diminish the variety of literary voices. Uh, and that, that's not good for the culture. Copyright was created um, you know, by the founders in the belief that a diversity and a multiplicity of literary voices would enrich the democracy. And we're veering from uh, that vision uh, as you know, these corporate behemoths try to gobble up copyright. And uh, it's not good for the culture, even though. What, uh, it must have an effect on the. Uh must have a hell of an effect on the university presses as well, which have, have The always... university presses are going out of business left and right. That's what they're, I mean. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're more and more of them are just online enterprises. Well, I mean, there are so many disasters, obviously, for, right? I mean, I, my daughter gave me a Kindle book, or a Kindle thing, and I said, take it back. <laughs> I buy books. And, uh, you buy now, books and you read books in volume. I read books, but I buy, I, now, the other thing about books, of course, is there are those horrible uh, uh, books that are made with, they fall apart, like in three yeah. months. I mean, the shit that they. Well, that's because. You can't even buy a well made book. Because publishers are trying to cut costs no, everywhere I they can. I understand, but my God, it drives you nuts. You got a book for a week. Now, I'm pretty abusive. <laughs> I mean, hardly anybody can read my books from the coffee stains alone, but. Uh, but still, they, for them to fall apart as fast as they do. But this, this thing is, uh, it's funny because I've actually, <laughs> usually after I've had a few drinks, I came up with somebody in a place says, you know, you really shouldn't use that. But give that away. Buy the damn book. <laughs> Spring for the goddamn money. You're sitting in first class. You know, <laughs> buy the book. And they look at you like you're completely out of your mind. Which, of course, certainly is something you would argue. But uh, I, I just, uh, to me, I mean, I, I understand the technology, blah, blah, blah. I don't give a damn. I don't care what the convenience is. Buy the damn book, carry a book bag, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian Dennehy. Satchel from here. In my wife's expensive leather bag, because I <laughs> gotta carry all his books. God damn it. 
Thanks, Brian. It's great to have you do an interview at Live Talks LA. Scott, terrific to have you back. Thank Our you video too. will be out soon. We will be bringing a table out onto the stage, and Scott will sign your books. The bookseller is in the lobby if you want to pick up a few extra copies. There's a holiday around the corner. You know something? Also, I'll tell you, if you haven't read all of his books, read them. It, because they're a treat. I had a whole bunch of stuff picked out here, but nobody wants to listen to me. <laughs> because they're just, he's such a good writer. Such a really good writer. We talked before about, uh, about George and Elmore, and they were terrific writers, but this guy is the, the, the thing. It's a complete, interesting character, beautifully written. And the one sentence just leads you to the other. It's just beautiful stuff. So if you're here just for curiosity, say, get off your ass and buy some books. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, Brian. Good to see you.